lift up your own concerns for the Lord and would you pray with me that God would open your hearts, your minds, your souls as I pray regularly for myself is Lord teach me, uh, show me, open my heart, help me to understand. It's been a prayer for mine for, uh, since, since day one of uh, there's so much to learn and he's the teacher and so therefore my prayer must be, foundational prayer must be Lord teach me. Uh, help me to understand. If it's one thing I've realized over the numerous amount of time that I've spent in study and, and uh, reading, and, and boy, it sure is hard to get it all at one time. Has anybody recognized that? You just don't sit down, read the Bible, and say, oh, well, thank God I got it. Have you noticed that? It's, th th there's a process to it. Because we can read it, but we're not always equipped to hear it or understand it. Then someone tells you something and you say, well, how does that fit in? So all of a sudden you hear something else and you say, well, then how does that work? And oh, those two to go together, but gee, that opens up too. And you never notice it just keeps going and you, you keep learning and learning and learning. So obviously we need the Holy Spirit. If he's the teacher, then we, and, there's, and this book has been revealed over the ages through countless people, we need to have his spirit teaching us, helping us to understand. Me, you, us, all of us, till we see him in his fullness, we need the Holy Spirit. So Father in heaven, we just lift up this body of believers, Lord. You've gathered us together in this place at this hour, Lord, at such a time as this that we would learn of you, know you, understand who you are in our lives. Father, let the peace of God rule in our hearts. Let the joy of the Lord explode, Lord, in our beings. Help us, Lord, to really tonight, all of us, have a teachable spirit. That we, Lord, would be willing to comply to the character, the concerns, and the conduct of the Holy Spirit. That we truly would want who you are in our lives. That we would have a willing yes in our souls. Saying, yes, Lord Jesus. Not my will, but yours. That we truly would want all that you have for us. Even at the willing to forsake all the things that aren't you, such as this world. Lord, let your blessing fall upon each and every person. Lord, they've been through a hard day. They've been through a hard week. All kinds of concerns, all kinds of family issues, financial issues, all kinds of uh, 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 relational issues, uh, always uh, even dealing with ourselves. Lord, I pray that right now each and every person would just be able to release it to you and say, okay, this time I am investing in you. Invest in me, Lord. I'm investing in you and I know exponentially you'll invest in me a hundredfold. So Father, I open my heart to you. I open my soul to you. I push out and bring every thought into obedience of Christ and say, Lord, would you please teach me? I ask, Lord, that they would make it very personal. That this wouldn't just be a prayer by the wayside and the byside because that's the way we're used to opening the service. But Lord, it would truly would be something personal, something private, something wonderful, saying, Lord, teach me. I'm reminded, Lord, of just my son-in-law, Adam, down in uh, Virginia, who called me late last night. And he had an experience with the Lord. He's so excited that something happened in his life, something experientially, something exploded in his mind, something in his being. He, he, he went into a, uh, Olivia's room all by himself, turned on praise music and says, I've just got to praise him. And all of a sudden the Lord descended and came upon him and his praise came forth and he was weeping before God and God Almighty had an experience with the Lord. That's what it's all about. Having not just knowledge, not just being able to quote the verse, not being able to just say it rightly, but to truly know God. Lord, inspire us tonight. Touch souls, touch minds. Cause us to come awake and alive in Christ Jesus. Let us, Lord God, be in full compliance with the Spirit of God. Let us all, Lord Jesus, come to the unity of the faith and understand who you are in our lives. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Great testimony, isn't it? That, so, wonderful to see. Young man, alone, my, his wife and daughter over here visiting with us. He's been alone, uh, working, coming home, and, and uh, all of a sudden he was just going to do this and do that, and the Lord spoke to him and says, go put praise music on. And he went into the, Olivia's room where there's nothing in the middle. He put on praise music and started praising the Lord. And all of a sudden he just praising and praising and just, just praising him, and boom, Holy Spirit fell. Touched his life. 
not just like he had the Holy Ghost goosebumps. I'm talking about like life changing. Like he called, and then the Lord said, call your father-in-law. Isn't that a great, you know it's the Lord then, right? <laughs> so <laughs> call Gary. And he did. He was obedient. He said, I know it's late, but, and I said, no, anytime. And he just started just expressing. And he goes, the Lord told me to call you. Well, I don't know what else to say. He said everything. <laughs> and so then just prayed and we spoke into his life. And, but that's what the Holy Spirit does. But it's because he's been studying, he's been praying, he's been searching, he's been looking for, he's been reading the scriptures, he's doing lesson plans, and then all of a sudden he was obedient to go do this. Could have easily have just said, oh, well, I'll just go mow the lawn, or I'll just do the dishes, or I'll just get this done. Or, you know, we can always find something to do. Lord, deliver us from something to do. Deliver us from the something else in life, but make us first and foremost do what the Lord would have us to do. Amen? Praise the Lord. Praise God. I'm excited about it all. I'm excited what God's doing here in this church body. So, well, tonight we're embarking on a new section dealing with the Holy Spirit. We dealt with the introduction of the spirit world. We dealt with uh, the person of the Holy Spirit, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. We've gone down and dealt with the character of the Holy Spirit. We dealt with the conduct of the Holy Spirit. We've dealt with the concerns of the Holy Spirit. And now we kind of enter into the big section. The section that everybody usually wants to start with 24 months ago, which is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is usually where everybody, when you're saying, well, we're going to have, uh, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, immediately most people want to go directly to that. They want to know basically how the Holy Spirit moves and what do you got for me, usually what it comes down to. What have you got for me? Where am I fitting all of this? But to go into the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we usually have to go through it. The best way is to understand who He is first and what's He all about. Now we understand about the holiness of God, the love of God, the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, the gentleness of God. We understand who He is in our lives, what He's doing, His concerns. So in this, when we understand His concerns, His conduct, His character, now the gifts fit in. Saying, okay, this is what they're for. This is what He's doing. So this is where we're embarking on tonight, is the gifts of the Holy Spirit, part one. Now first we have to also do some introductory understanding. Number one, and I think you're all aware of this, we live in a spiritual world. Now we can say that, but not everybody really understands that. We can say we live in a spiritual world and we say yes, but we really have to understand when we say we live in a spiritual world, it means that the world that you see, I see, that we exist in around us, that, we are, that is known by our five senses, is not the real eternal world. It's the temporal passing world. The, we live in actually a spiritual world that you and I are currently existing in, and what is preventing us from actually seeing, knowing, and understanding the fullness of the spiritual world is this flesh body that we're in. The body that you find yourself in, this flesh body, this body of flesh, this uh, uh, tent, this veil, is preventing you, hindering you from seeing, understanding, knowing the spiritual world in its fullness, the way it really is. I think, personally, I think we'd be scared to death if we saw it really what it is. <laughs> because we're not equipped we're not equipped to even live and exist there or to battle it. If you saw really what everybody is submitting to, it would scare you. So when we realize that the spirit world is around us and that we live in a world of spirits, if it's a spiritual world, we have to also recognize that there is a multitude of spirits also in the world. A multitude of spirits. The Bible even says innumerable that they're beyond number, like the sands of the sea. So in this, we must recognize that in a spiritual world, which is the real world, the foundation to all things the, is a spiritual world, and that there's in this spiritual world, meaning that it's not just a world you can't see, but there are actually spirits, and that they're real, and that they're more real than the body you're in. Because this body's passing away. They're more real than the body you find yourself in. And in this spiritual world, and in this world of spirits, there is only one Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? There's only one spirit 
that you can actually call the Holy Spirit. That He's high and lifted up and there's none like Him. Does that make sense? We have to understand that. You and I can't see, we can't live in the fullness of this spiritual world with any type of understanding because this flesh body prevents us, which illustrates, and this is important, the flesh body hinders you. Remember, Christ was prepared a body. Christ was prepared a body. God Almighty was in Christ, reconciling the world. Our body was prepared for him. God was in Christ, preparing the world. And it says that his flesh body, that is his veil, the veil. The veil that, that kept him, like the veil in the temple, that veil represented his body. So his body, you prevented you, anyone, from seeing God within. Just like your body currently prevents one of us or anyone from seeing what's really going on inside. Does that make sense? So we can only see the effects, the symptoms, the manifestation of what's really going on inside. Whether one is of Christ or whether one is not of Christ. We can, only, we can determine what's the influence, what's the dominating spirit, what's going on only by what course of action is taken, what words come out of one's mouth, what they, what they apply themselves to. We can basically look at the fruit that's being manifested and determine what tree it is. Does that make sense? That's when usually the unbeliever comes in and says, oh, you're, you're judging. No, I can see the fruit that's being manifested and the Bible says I can determine what tree it's of by that. That's just, just good discernment. So, in this, the flesh body veils us, illustrates also that what hides us from being able to enter into the presence of God is the flesh nature. There's the body of flesh, this body, and then there's the flesh nature, meaning the nature that we inherited from Adam. That sinful, disobedient nature that you and I struggle with all day long, not only within ourselves, but all around us. Does anybody understand that one? Yeah. <laughs> that one we usually got. <laughs> so, in this, uh, we, see it's, we see the presence of the spirit world in manifestation, but we don't actually see what's going on. Uh, we see the effects, we see the influence. Uh, but we don't see clearly what it is. That's why the Bible says for us to walk by faith, not by sight, because the sight only sees what is being manifested according to the natural, but faith sees into the realm of God's promises, God's purposes, God's plans, God's personhood, God's power, God's presence. So in this by faith, we can delve and see and know and bring, obedient, bring obedience into play and know what God is doing. And even when, though we see as a blur, we still can be, hear God's word and be obedient to it. Because we can't see and we don't know, but we trust knowing he does. Does that make sense? Okay. So, in this, we also have to understand as we're going into the gifts that there are, these spirits are in dominion in this world. In the confines of this world, this, these spirits have dominion. They are in power. They have authority. They have control. And they're everywhere. Remember? Innumerable. Multitudes. And they're everywhere. Nations have them. Even the book of Daniel talks about the rising of nations. And, and uh, we, we see uh, Michael the archangel being released and uh, Gabriel sending a message. And we see angels at work and we see the spiritual world battling. And there's all kinds of spirits. Uh, there, there's all kinds of influences that are taking place. All kinds of sinful activity. There's all kinds of angels as well. Holy angels. When we say holy angels, meaning not evil, not wicked. Holy, meaning they belong to God. They're His, and they exemplify His nature and carry out His character, conduct, and concerns. They're basically obedient, they're reverent, they're wise, they're meek, they're mighty, they're holy, so that they operate within the confines and in compliance with God. The wicked spirits are all contrary to God. In other words, they're all operating in the realm of anti-God, 
or we could say anti-Christ. So they're against God, they're against Christ, they're anti-Christ. They're all anti-truth. If they're anti-truth, what are they for? Lies, deception, right? If they're anti-light, what are they for? What are they uh, involved with? Darkness. If they're anti uh, anti-goodness, what are they? Evil, right? So if they're anti-good, they're out for bad. If they're anti, then they're promoting the direct opposite. And we see the results of it in almost every town, right? You, you can just go to a family get-together and you should be able to start spotting something, <laughs> right? <laughs> As a matter of fact, at a family get-together, you should start even picking out some of the very ones that were once had dominion over you. Because you should be able to spot them quicker because you once had familiarity with them. So you'll start spotting it. The one who was brought up under a domination of gossip should be able to start picking out gossip real quick. That dominion, that, that influence. So whether it's uh, addiction, whether it's deception, whether it's lies, whether it's uh, lust, whether it's pride, whether it's vanity, whether it's selfishness, whether it's envy, whether it's covetousness, and I'm sure you could probably add 10 or 20 to the list. That dominion will be there, that presence. It's trained that family in the ways of evil. It's trained that dad. It's trained that mom. It's had influence and dominion in that family. Sometimes it just could be spiritual pride. Religion. Where they have a look of godliness but deny the power of it. So in this we can start recognizing various spiritual controls. One of my Jobs, responsibilities, is to constantly be on guard of the spiritual essence of our body. Whether something's rising that I have to watch, be careful of, always keeping my, um, a hand on the pulse of things. Who's talking with who? Uh, new visitors come in right away, I'm keen on. Why? Because you're looking for and wondering as to what's going on in the body. So you, you have to understand, even your own kids will come home from school or come home from a friend's or you'll see something going on in their lives. They've picked up some sort of message, some sort of influence, some worldview. And that's just not some thought. Instead, that's some influence. Your quest and their quest and our quest is constantly to encourage people to come under the sway, the influence, and the dominion of the Holy One. Which, if you've noticed, that's a battle. That's a war, isn't it? It's a war. Trying to always encourage, and, and, you, and you know this, and I've said it before, you can't just take them and say, come here, give me those three fingers, plug them in. Right? Oh, good, you got it. It doesn't work that way. Boy, would it be nice if they did. Right? But it just doesn't work that way. Do you notice that you can't demand it, though you need to demand it? You can't command it, though you need to command it. You can't just keep dragging them, though you need to drag them. But it doesn't make it happen until they say, I want the dominion of the Holy Spirit in my life. I want Jesus. I'm going to live for him. I'm no longer going to please the influences in this world operating through my friends. Did you hear what I said? I'm no longer going to please and submit and be attentive to the spiritual realms that are showing up in and through my friends that I call peer pressure or be accepted or whatever. You're yielding to something that's not God and instead you're going to be willing to reject that and receive that scorn and rejection and be willing to say, no, I want to be totally under the dominion of the Holy Spirit. The one who's not like any of them. In that, that's where your battle, my battle constantly is. And even people coming in this door, what are we doing every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Monday night? Always what? Trying to pray in, preach through, and praise people to come under the dominion of the Holy Spirit. Let go of all the other realms that are showing themselves in a scornful face. Showing themselves in a contemptible eye. Showing themselves in a haughty eyelid. Showing themselves in a frowning face. Showing themselves in a, what are you, ridiculous? What are you, holier than now? And a, and a coming against you in such a manner. And you've, you've seen them. And as a matter of fact, before you were with Christ, you probably exemplified them. You did them. I did them. I remember the night that I gave my life to the Lord, just a half hour before, I was laughing at the guys raising their hands. 
as I sat in the back pew saying, how ridiculous. Then they gave an altar call and there I am. <laughs> how does that happen? Why does God let you set yourself up as a fool? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so that's what happens. That's what God does. That's the most important thing to understand, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, because most people are looking for, seeking, trying to get the gifts in order to show themselves as gifted. In order to show themselves as anointed. As in order to show themselves as I've got more than you. All flesh nature operating as in the spirit. Putting on a show, basically parading. Rather than actually saying and realizing that the whole idea of gifts, Holy Spirit's gifting in the church body is to cause people to come alive in Christ and grow in Him. If we start using it for selfish means, then we're taking the very thing that God gave us and using it for gain for ourselves. The Lord has given gifts to men. But we live in a spiritual world and the gifts that he gives us are to work against those by promoting him, advancing the gospel. This world, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, is that there's principalities and powers of the air. Do you remember that when it talks about that? In the book of Ephesians when it talks about the armor of the Lord, the minute that you hear the word armor, what immediately comes to mind? Warfare. Armor is dealing with warfare. When you're having armor, you're dealing with a battle. The battle is the Lord's. Have you heard that? The battle is the Lord's. So if the battle is the Lord's, He's going to equip you for warfare. His warfare, His battle, His way, His gifts. You and I are the, the armor bearer. Such as with Jonathan had his armor bearer, David has, Saul had, they had their armor bearer. You and I are that armor bearer, ready to go in warfare. David slung that rock in the sling, when in actuality God was slinging David as the little rock at the gods of Philistines. That's really what was taking place. Shaming that Dagon of the Philistines is not God. God is God. The battle is the Lord's. The Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says that there's principalities and powers of the air. Principalities and powers meaning that in high places there's a spiritual world that conducts authority over all this world that you and I know. Now you and I can look at this world and say, well there's a lot of things that you can't tell me that that's bad. Nor am I going to tell you that it's good. Because the Bible specifically says only God is good. And Jesus said, this world has nothing in me. You put it together. What's that equate to? <laughs> right? So therefore, all of the things that are going on in this world, even if they have a look of goodness to them, when in actuality is evil because anything that is not of faith is not of the Lord. Anything that's not holy is not of him. He says, this world has nothing in me. So the church all of a sudden takes on enormous significance because God has placed his spirit in the church, sojourning, pilgriming through this world. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, says that the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a pretty big thing. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 says that the whole world, how much of it? The whole world. All of it. And when God says whole, he doesn't mean except for America. He doesn't mean just for. He means the whole world, the worldly system. All its politics, I know I wouldn't have a hard time convincing you there. <laughs> all of its finances, all of its structures, all of its religions, all of its business affairs, all of its relationships, all of its entertainment, everything is under the sway of what? The wicked one. Who's the wicked one? Satan himself. Satan means adversary, the one who's against. 
as we talked about earlier, the one who's against God, against truth, against goodness, against purity, against honesty, against life. He's for death. He's the destroyer. So that's why you see his activity always trying to crush the babies, destroy the innocence of the young, rape, destroy, kill, thief, lie, deceive, bring darkness, insecurity, fear, lust, vanity, always seeing this stirred everywhere, even compete, you must win, you must win, you must win. If you don't, you're a loser, you're a failure. See, you're a loser, you're a failure, you lost, you didn't win. The whole world is under that sway all the time. It's not like if you try to get a break from it. There's no break from it. There's only one place to escape. And the Bible calls it the refuge. That is, of course, the person of Christ Jesus. Hiding yourself in him and finding your identity in Christ. That's what it's all about. The Holy Spirit. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, calls him the God of this age. The God of this age. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, calls him the God of this age. That means that the age that we're currently in, he is deemed the God of this age. This temporal age, this current earth, this current heaven that you and I look up into, all that's around us, he is the God of this age. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age. The Bible doesn't deny it, and Christ didn't deny it. Right? When the devil came directly against Christ in the wilderness of temptation, he offered him the kingdoms, and not, not once did Christ ever say, they're not yours to give. He acknowledged that they were his to give. This the God of this age. You and I are currently, therefore, under the dominion of the Holy Spirit. We possess the Holy Spirit. We have God Almighty in us, soldiering in the camp of the enemy. You and I are basically behind enemy lines. Working the things of the character. We're exemplifying the conduct. We're looking to advance the concerns of the Holy Spirit behind enemy lines where he's the God of this age. And here's the kicker that each and every one of us must understand. God Almighty, and I, this hopefully will be conveyed properly to you, and I hope I convey it properly. God Almighty uh, respects, honors the authority of the God of this age. It's his. This authority, this dominion, is his dominion. Christ never said, yeah, and I'm going to take it back. It's all mine. See, already, he's already looked at on the cross, this has been cut off from him. The world's been cut off to me and I from the world. This dominion he is currently under, Christ even came and submitted himself to, even unto death. That's why we're constantly encouraged in Scripture to submit to submit to authorities, to submit to. And that's why it's such a play, because even Michael the archangel did not contest with the devil for the body of Moses, but instead said, the Lord rebuke you, daring not to uh, condemn where it was not his place to do so. That's a tough one to grasp. Because we're dealing, first of all, with understanding authority in this world. It is, he is the God of this age. But he and this age, and all that you see, and all the wicked ones, and all the principalities and powers, and the earth, and the heaven, and all its systems will one day be cleansed away. But currently, while it stands, he's still the God of this age. And that has been reinforced in Scripture. And so when the Holy Spirit came... He came unto the vessels of the church and poured in and never once came and says, now go take over the world and take over the dominions. Did he do that? Do you see it anywhere? Even though it's preached and taught that way in Scripture, you'll find that in the book of Acts, it's go and baptize, teach, teach them to submit, train them in the ways of God, tell them to persevere, to endure. Does that not? So our quest is not to 
quote unquote, take over. Because it's his. The whole world is under his sway. But you don't have to be and must not be under the sway because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. 1 John 4.4. 4. Right? So in this, we submit because we know there's one greater than God, greater than the God of this age, which is God Almighty, who holds dominion over all things and is ushering in his promises. Does that make sense? This is a tough one to grasp. Because it's dealing with authority, obedience, and submission and understanding that the God of this world truly does have sway over, the, over all of this. Our quest always is to cause people to turn towards God. And when they turn towards God, when people become born again, they no longer give ear to Him. When He says lie, they say, no, I submit to God and resist the enemy. It doesn't, and He'll flee. He'll flee when you submit to God and resist the enemy, meaning he no longer has, he's no longer swaying over you. Do this and do that. He no longer has you to do his work. So you become now a vessel of honor rather than a vessel of dishonor. You be now use your instruments as an instrument of righteousness rather than an instrument of unrighteousness. You now become a tool of holiness rather than a tool of unholiness. You now become one who's moving the kingdom ahead in your life, because greater is he who is in you than he is in the world, and encouraging others to do the same, thereby taking away the power, not that he doesn't have the power, but he no longer has the power to exercise in and through you. So in this, you therefore have nullified his power and have given it to God Almighty. Moving, letting him move in through your midst, saying, no, honesty is going to prevail in my life. Purity is going to prevail in my life. Not greed. No, nope. giving. No, nope. not offense. Forgiving. Not offense. Thanksgiving. I've, I'm free. Truth is going to prevail in my life, not lies and deception. I don't have to prove myself to you. I have to instead prove myself to him. In the sense of, Lord, I'm yours. Do your work in me. We start listening to his voice and shut out that old evil voice. Thus, taking away any power he had over you. Not that you're still not in under the God of this age, but he no longer is swaying you just because simply you're saying no to dishonesty, no to impurity, no to whatever the case may be. Does that make sense? If one captures this, you will find tremendous freedom because you only have two choices. So it's not like it's hard to figure out. We're either under the sway fully and wholly of the dominion of the presence of the Holy Spirit and learning of Him, which is what we're all here for tonight. Or we're, if we're not, then you don't have to necessarily figure out which one you've got. You're, you're subject to all of them. And they don't, they're not choosy. Lying, impurity, envy, jealousy, uh, lust, uh, addiction. Uh, you pick the one you want, anyone you want. As long as it's not, and if he can't keep you under that dominion, as long as he just keeps you apathetic. As long as he just keeps you in a state of apathy. Just kind of lazy, slumber, sloth, don't care, indifferent. As long as he keeps you there. All right, you want to come to church? Good, come to church. Just sit there. Sit. That's it. Just sit. Good. You're still under the sway of sloth. So, oh well, you know, yeah, well, uh, gee, at least I'm getting to heaven. You sure? It says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You tell me. So in this, we must recognize that we only have two choices. We either say yes fully and wholly to the Holy Spirit, or if we're not, then a part of us or all of us is saying yes to the things of the enemy. Does that make sense? So in this, the Holy Spirit of Christ respects authority. He respects authority. But he is not of this world. He made that quite clear. He operates without usurping Satan's authority. Make sure you understand that. He operates, the Holy Spirit operates, without ever usurping authority. He doesn't usurp it. He doesn't undermine. He doesn't conspire. Excuse me. He doesn't conspire. But always instead exercising what God has, what God's concerns are, and looking for and calling for people to turn towards him under the conviction of sin. Now, in this, as born-again believers, meaning the seed of God is in you. You've been born again. 
I'm assuming and I'm assured that at least the, most of you, if not all of you, I'm saying you have the Holy Spirit. Is that not so? Right? So isn't that a, isn't that a great thing? You got all these people in this room gathered together for what? Because you have the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the living God that we just got done talking about has set up His authority in your life. And we're submitting to that authority or we're rebelling against that authority. True? We're either yielding to it or we're defying it. In other words, self-will comes against God-will. So instead of humility, we start getting haughtiness. So in this, we have to have this battle going on and we're saying yes to the born-again believer inside. We're saying yes to that God has dominion in my life. I'm born again, a child of God, and John chapter 1 says that I have the right to be called a child of God. That's a marvelous thought. This child, though, as child, as son of God, must grow up. Remember that? Concerns of the Holy Spirit. No longer tossed to and fro with childish doctrines and wicked spirits, but learning who he is in our lives. That the work of Christ is applied to every believer. God has a work for you to do. God has a work for me to do. We must believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and exemplify, experience his life and exemplify his life each and every day. Now in this, the Bible says that God has given gifts to men. God has given gifts to men. Gifts to help us to be kingdom minded. Gifts to help us to overcome the world that is around us. He's given, first of all and foremost, he's given you the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Meaning if it's a gift, you didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. It's not credited to you because you were wonderful or you did something wonderful or you came to some measure of holiness or that. But it's a gift. He gave you the Holy Spirit. In this, it helps us to be kingdom minded, overcome this world, that we are to express his light, to experience his glory, to make him known that righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit that we talked about last time, that, that righteousness, peace, and joy of the Holy Spirit that we start experiencing and expressing. I find some people will experience it, they just can't bring it into expressing it on Monday morning. True? They experience it, they talk about it, they praise it, but then expressing it on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday where they're getting in trouble. Getting up in the morning with a thankful heart. Lord, you've given me this day. I'm going to honor you with it. Now, God has given gifts to men. The word that is used mainly for the word gifts is charisma. Charisma. The most wide usage is charisma. C-H-A-R-I-S-M-A. -S charisma. Charisma is the root word where we get the word charismatic. That's where we get the word charismatic. You probably have heard like that, even the charismatic movement. Or you've heard that personality, that person's very charismatic. That chari they have charisma. That whole idea of being uh, outgoing, uh, excitable. That whole idea of being expressive. Charismatic. When they said this is the charismatic movement, the Holy Spirit came upon the, 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 uh, the church. And they called it the charismatic. They were very outgoing, very expressive. So a person has a, a personality that's full of charisma or a charismatic. They're outgoing. They're expressive. You see it in their, in their walk, the way they speak. Well, this word charisma is the, is the word that is translated as gifts. Gifts come to charisma. The gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has given gifts, Christ gave gifts, God gave gifts is charisma. That's where we see it coming. Not earned, not given by partiality, not deserved, but rather a gift has been given. Now one of the hardest things to do when we're dealing with the gifts is to try to label them, categorize them, or say systematize them in order to facilitate understanding. Because throughout the New Testament, you see a variety of different things in regards to gifts. Is that not so? There's all kinds of books and teachings that are out there as well. Everyone seems to be wanting a chapter or two in order to sell a book. And you've got all kinds of information coming and you've got it all exercised in a variety of ways in churches. 
and you've got some who are trying to be overly uh, expressive in their gifts. We're a gifted church. We're, we believe in the gifts. We believe in, and you have all of these various doctrines and all those various traditions and all these people trying to prove they got the gifts and you've got it in scripture and the, the hard part is going to be trying to systematize it in a way to facilitate, to bring forth comprehension, understanding as to what's really the scripture saying and operate church in accordance with those. Does that make sense? Also, we want to make sure that we're not putting God in a box. That's definitely, that's the other swing Whereas, well, we certainly don't want to be like that. So instead, we're going to make sure that we're not going to be like that charismatic church. So we're going to be, make sure it doesn't happen to me. If it's God, he's going to have to blow me over. Right? And, right? and they just, so they go the other swing to make sure I don't want it to happen to me. God's going to have to really, when really all he's saying, why don't you just release yourself and trust me? When we trust him and just allow him to flow as rivers of living water out of our belly. Having a body of believers that are able, willing, and humble enough to accept correction. Usually churches allow themselves to go to foo-foo. True? What, is there a better word? They just get kind of off on the, on the, on the edges. Trying to prove that they're a really spiritual church. Then they go out and do every carnal thing that's out there. But they come to church on Sunday and just, oh, dance before God. Because we're in the spirit. When they're probably not expressing it through the week. Any obedience to God. So someone sees that and says, oh, no, they're rolling on the floors. They're jumping on the ceilings. The guy's toupee still on the ceiling. <laughs> so they instead pull away from that and instead decide to be very biblical. Very scriptural. In other words, very religious. And very stoic in their stance of, you're not going to push me over. We had a guy over there one time who was uh, at, at Zion. He was uh, uh, very much into making sure that people fell over when he prayed for them. He always gave them help. <laughs> Puts one foot in front of the other. <laughs> the, guy, the guy, and he leans a little forward, and he's a big fellow. He leans a little forward, and he comes over, and he tries to push him. He's not, he's not going. He's <laughs> praying. <laughs> All of a sudden, there was another gentleman who was a, uh, a part of the school, an uh, older fellow named, and the Lord spoke to him and says, go pray for her. And he gets up, and he walks up to him, and just gets within six inches, five inches of his forehead, just taps him on the hair, and he goes back right over the pew. Boom. Over, and down he went. See, the, the Holy Spirit can, can do that. Now, what if we would have said, no, you can't do that, and you can't do this, and you know, we don't want that, and we have to control. If you, we try to control the movement of the Holy Spirit, we're in trouble. But if we also don't exercise order, we're in trouble. So that balance, and I hate to use the word balance, but rather that appropriateness must be always in the body. Let all that you do be done decently and in order. That's the key. Corinthians, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, who was a greatly troubled church, and says, let all that you do be done in love. Let all that you do be done decently and in order. Let all that you do be done for edification. So if we do that, we're in good shape. But a lot of times, pastor or leadership doesn't want to correct anybody because we don't want to offend anybody. Because if they're offended, they'll stop coming and then we've got a battle. And when in actuality, they, that offense should come up because now we have opportunity to bring humility into that position. Right? It must happen. Offense will come. So in this, we can instead gather a person so that they grow above and beyond. But all of a sudden, they don't do this, or they don't want that, or they try to control. Or they... And I remember being at a prayer meeting where all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit actually really started moving upon this whole group of pastors, about 40 of us. The Holy Spirit were praising, and you could just sense the Holy Spirit moving. That guy running that show shut that down so fast. In the assembly, shut it right down. He had an agenda. Wanted to follow. He had a certain time schedule. He had to get things done. Wanted to get things done. Shut it down. Nope. All right. Well, let's just shake hands with the person next to you and let's and just everybody sit down. Let's get back to order. But it was order man-made, not order of the Holy Spirit. Fearful of losing control. We must be ready for what the Holy Spirit has for us with proper understanding. It's taken two years for us to get to this point. Do you realize that? When we started 
two years ago on the Holy Spirit, I remember having more people than this show up on the first night. Do you remember? And then when we talked about just the spirit world, only about half came back. Because they were looking for something else. We had all kinds of visitors. They were looking for something else. They are looking for, again, that Holy Spirit stuff. Rather than realizing the Holy Spirit is a person. To be known. And so, therefore, it's taken us two years to get to this point to understand the gifts of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, in looking at the gifts, the first place, I've categorized them in three ways. We're only going to be able to cover one of them, or not even fully one of them tonight. The first to understand this gifts of the Holy Spirit is to understand, first of all, that Christ gave gifts to the church. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, first of all. Ephesians chapter 4. Now, as you're turning there to Ephesians chapter 4, there's three categories that we're going to approach this with. Three main categories in Scripture that I think is the best way to understand the spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit, to understand what the Holy Spirit is doing in the church, to advance His conduct, His concerns, and His character in the church and in the world. So in this, there's three categories. Number one is what we're going to cover in Ephesians chapter 4. Number one, Christ's gifts to the church. Write that down if you're taking notes. Christ's gifts to the church. That's the first one we're going to cover. That's the first round. Christ gave gifts to the church. Ephesians chapter 4. Second, after we get done with Ephesians 4, Christ's gifts to the church, we're going to move to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and a little bit in 14. So, but 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That will be the second category. So if you want to read ahead, these will be three great chapters to read and study. Ephesians chapter 4, Christ's gifts to the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, gifts of the Holy Spirit. And then lastly, our third category, Romans chapter 12, spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. So we're going to look at these three main categories of the Holy Spirit operating in the church. Why? To advance His character in our lives and in others. To advance His conduct in our lives and in others. And to make known and advance His concerns in our lives and in others. In this world, fully submissive to Him at all times. We're going to look at Christ's gifts to the church, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, and spiritual gifts, Romans chapter 12. Those three chapters would be great to learn, to study, to read, to understand. If you capture these three categories, I think you will have a great understanding of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit's doing in the church and in your life. Now, the thing to remember is even though it says Christ's gifts to the church, Gifts of the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts, remember it's all the Holy Spirit. It's all the Holy Spirit. He is the Spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit is in you, in us. Greater is He who is in the, us than He is in the world. That's the Holy Spirit. It's all the Holy Spirit and anything that we exemplify in the goodness and in the honor of the Holy Spirit, it's Him. So, uh, we must recognize that these three categories, even though we say Christ and the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts, it's all the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, you and I do not know God. So true? Nor do we make Him known. We don't know Him and we can't make Him known. If you and I try to make God known outside of the presence of the Holy Spirit, we're in the flesh and thereby promoting just that which is of human endeavors. A religion. So, when we're looking at this, we first have to look at Ephesians chapter 4. Looking there, and it says in verse 9. Uh, so let's go to 7 first. 7. It says, But to each one of us grace was given, according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this... Verse 9, he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? 
He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Here's the key. And he himself, Christ gives to the church, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. This is to better understand the gifts, Christ's gifts to the church, dealing first of all with the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher operating in the church body. And you must have all five operating to have a healthy body. It's called basically, we can say, the five-fold ministry of the church. This is a must to see this develop. When we're coming into the maturity of the Lord, coming into what God wants of us, what God wants His church, the universal church, the local church, the, the district church, meaning as to a variety of... What does He want? He wants to see... He's looking to see some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, all arising and becoming and operating in that giftedness. There for the purpose of what? Number 12, verse 12. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Amen? So when we're looking at this equipping of the saints and edifying of the body of Christ, that Christ gave gifts to the church, first thing that we must, must, must recognize is that it's all working in accordance with a, uh, Acts chapter 1-8, you shall be witnesses unto me. So we want to see a church, we want to see an individual, we want to see a corporate body. You shall be witnesses unto me, Acts 1-8. And also, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. Be good to turn there. Just keep your finger here on Ephesians. Matthew chapter 28. Some of you probably already know it by heart. It's a very common verse, but a very powerful one. Christ in his post-resurrection state, but yet has not yet ascended into heaven. Says in verse 19 and 20, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. First of all, what's it begin with in verse 19? Go. Each and every one of us must have a go in our hearts. It really could be, the same which, uh, uh, translation could be, as you go. As you go and as you proceed through life, no matter where you go, do this. What does he want us to do? Make disciples of all nations. Wherever God brings you, wherever you are, wherever you, you and I must have a go in our hearts. Make disciples. Of who? All the nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things. Notice the importance on the teaching. Teaching them. Teach them what? Teach them to observe. Teach them to observe what? All the things that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Notice in verse 18. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority has been given unto me. Here we see that Christ Almighty has all authority has been given unto him. But we are still, even though all authority has been given unto him, and he can exercise it freely and as he wishes because he has conquered death, he gives it unto the gifts of the church, the Holy Spirit, 
But notice that we're still in this body and in the confines of this world, so therefore we're still under the sway of the God of this age. But not your new man in Christ. Your new man in Christ is subject fully and wholly to the Lord, and you and I present these instruments as unto him, fully submissive for his labor, for his work, for his love. Does it make sense? Okay. So our job is to, to have this go, make disciples. So what are the gifts for? Make disciples. What are these gifts for? To teach. What are these gifts for? To move the kingdom of God ahead in our lives and in others. What is our quest even tonight? Is to cause understanding, teaching, learning, to bring forth what? So that a person would grow above and beyond where they were yesterday. Always striving to become more. Why? Because God also says he has rewards for him. He says he's bringing rewards. He's also, he wants us to live for him in light of all the evil that is around us. You and I are living contrary to this world. Seeking to live contrary to this world. Where the world all thinks that it's silly for what you're doing. When in actuality, they're proving themselves to be silly and foolish. But you and I did not see that till the Holy Spirit gave us his eyes. So, in Ephesians chapter 4, looking there again. First, 12, understanding the why do we have these five-fold giftings in the church. First, to the equipping of the saints. You probably have seen, heard, been in church at some point where the pastor was expected to basically do everything. It's kind of like the hired hand, the hired help set in, we're putting you in authority, you're, and now the pastor's supposed to do everything. When in actuality, when we're looking at this, what's it say? That the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher have been given into the church to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That it's, it's a body ministry. It's not a head leadership governance, we hired you to take care of this for us. That's basically, and I hope no one's offended by this, I really do, but that's basically the public school mentality today of parents dropping off their kids and saying it's your job to teach them. Is that not so? Wait a minute, we pay you to, to teach them. What happened to the parental responsibility of that it's our responsibility to train to teach? That's the responsibility. It's we, don't, we can't have in the church, the church body, the one who's hired, and we just hire everyone to just do everything so that we don't have to do anything. We just give our money. Nowhere do you see that in Scripture. You see instead a body ministry. That's what I love about what God's doing here. Do we not see every week body ministry taking place? People desiring to be equipped to serve the body of Christ. We see it all the time. God is, that's when I say God is doing wonderful things. That you don't find everywhere. Believe me. <laughs> My wife and I can attest, and I would say most of you could say the same thing. You don't find that everywhere where someone actually wants to know what it is that you can be part of, participate in the body of Christ. Instead of we pay our check and now we have a place to go, and when I need help, I'll call you. Open up the food closet. I need a check. Can someone come over and help me with this? I'll call you when I need you. Nowhere do you see that. Instead, you always see people pouring their lives into other people's lives. These five-fold giftings are to the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher are to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. It says here, the equipping of the saints, the believers. For what? For the work of ministry. What's ministry? Service. Ministry is not just, oh, ministry is, do you have to pray and you preach. Ministry is serving. What do we serve? Wherever there's a need. Wherever there's a place to honor. Wherever there's a place to prefer. Wherever there's a place to encourage. Wherever there's a place to teach, a correct, instruct. Wherever there's a place to help a person, to serve. The work of the ministry to make Christ known. Wherever there's a place to make Christ known, that's what we do. And we're here, and you notice equipping is not just, it's not just learning what your giftings are. 
It's overcoming any arrogance, any pride, any selfishness, any greed, any, right? It's overcoming those things that are really the enemy hindering us from service. It's not only that, but it's dealing with unbelief. To believe God. To really believe that God said that when you give one cup of water, it's accounted to you. To believe God. That it's not just, all right, Bible says I got to go and serve. I better go and just shovel them out. I better go and give them a meal. It's, it's not that. It's not only just giving, serving with a gladful heart that I can pour my life. I would want it done for me. I'm going to do it for them. But it's also realizing that when I do that, there's a reward connected to it. Everything in this life, people are doing something for a reward. We're built that way. Well, then why not work for the rewards that are promised yet not yet? Amen. To believe God that he's promised them. I'm going to believe God that he's going to give them. And I'm going to work towards and realize that every little thing that I do, every little prayer, every little pat on the back, every hug, every glass of water, every hug to a kid, every encouragement, every prayer, something's connected to it that has eternal value. It's worth it. But if you're going around making sure that everyone knows what you just did, he says, you already got your reward. Is that not what he said? You already got it. I already, got, I already gave it to you. You decided to get the temporal rather than the eternal. So, that's our choice. So we instead are looking for and realizing that we're to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Secondly, in verse 12, for the edifying of the body of Christ. What's edifying? Building up. Verse 12, remember that Christ is the chief cornerstone? That the apostles and the prophets are the foundational stones and that we, 1 Peter says, that we're living stones. Edifying is building up. Building us up, getting us into ready for, as living stones, ready for the temple of the living God, the eternal temple that God is building. The edifying, the building up of oneself in Christ Jesus. Building one's up. You know, there's a phrase out by the assemblies. I think it's called, we, we build people. It's a good statement. We build people. That we're looking to build Christ in you. We're looking to build up and make sure a person is stronger and better than they were. And I'm not talking like the bionic man, that we can make them faster, we can make them this, we can... I'm talking about that a whole new creation. That we build up that person, whereas once they were given to depression, now they say, wait a minute, no, I'm not listening to that voice anymore. That person's just been built up. Whereas they came to church uh, once a month, dragged in, all of a sudden started coming and started coming and listening and started taking those little steps of obedience and started realizing, wait a minute, I'm, I'm changing. I'm not talking the way I was talking. I'm not using those words anymore. I'm not laughing. Hey, I don't think that's funny. Well, a month ago you thought it was funny. Yeah, you know, but... Oh, you're going to church now. You know, I am. You know, you've been built up. Where all of a sudden you got a phone call and it was on. Oh, how can this happen to me? I can't believe it. And instead, all of a sudden it's, well, you know, you're going to have to trust the Lord. Where would that come from? All right. It's all of a sudden, well, you've just been built up. All of a sudden, somebody's trying to pull on your little sympathy string. Can't you give me a little attention? They're pulling. Wait a minute. Say, wait a minute. Now, you, well, how, where would you, what'd you do for devotions this morning? Hey, how come you're talking to me that way? I don't even know how come I'm talking that way. But you've been built up. You're no longer giving in to that sympathy card. You're no longer letting yourself be dumped on with every little problem that your daughter has, that your uncle has, that your aunt has, your grandmother has, your friend has, your co-worker has. Instead, you start realizing, I'm not the same person anymore. You're being built up. You're planting your feet. You're not retreating in timidity anymore. You know, somebody comes up and talks to you and you start pulling away. Somebody says, oh, you're a Christian? Oh, well, uh, uh, sometimes. You know, instead, you, you, you're not, you bet I am. Instead, you're built up. Building up one's faith. Building up one's holiness. Building up one's love. That's where these five-fold ministries are in the church. These functions in order to build people. Build saints. Build living stones. Build holiness. Build up what? Build it up so that it's bigger, better, deeper, stronger than it ever was before. Isn't that what it's all about? Isn't that what God is actually doing even in this body? I get excited about it. That when I see families, when I see people coming, when I see people overcoming, and then you know what kills it? What just, doesn't it just kill you when you see someone just kind of cash it in and not care and all of a sudden give themselves over to this and over to that way and start going down this road? And it just kills you. Why? Because it's going against the very thing that you were gifted for. 
The very thing that you were gifted and God wants to see, to build up, to equip, you start seeing, it just kills you. Oh, come on, you're pleading with them. Come on, you're correcting, you're instructing, you're looking, you're praying. And they keep going their own way. It just kills you, right? Because it goes directly against what we have been gifted for, what the concerns of the Holy Spirit are. That's why it goes against you. If you just says, oh, I don't even care anymore. Who God always is concerned, right? But sometimes that's our way of handling the hurt and the pain of it all. Instead, give it to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you're God. There's none like you. And you start looking towards the things of God instead. There's five-fold ministry. Looking at what it says here as we go on. Verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. Look how long it's going to go. This edifying and this equipping, this building up, this preparing, this encouraging... How long is it going to keep going? Till we all come to the unity of the faith. Till we all come to the knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Isn't that wonderful? We keep going, looking for that complete, perfect man. Remember the concerns of the Holy Spirit? Verse 14. What's he want out of this maturity, this stature, this fullness of Christ? that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Yeah, well, I heard and I read, and by the trickery of men, the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to do what? To deceive. The whole world lies under the enemy's sway. But what do we do? What's verse 15 say? But what do we do since we've been equipped, since we have the edifying of the body of Christ, since we have the Holy Spirit, what are we? What are we being trained to do? What is the fivefold gifts in the church? What are we here to be trained to do? Speaking the truth in love. Notice how it goes directly against trickery. Notice it goes directly against cunning craftiness. Notice it goes directly against de to deceive. But speak the truth. Yeah, I'm going to speak the truth. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind in love. And how come no scripture added that part? But speaking the truth. Some people pride themselves, I can really speak the truth. And love. That's the key. Can't we drop that part off? I just want to tell them what they should be doing in life. In love. Love believes all things. Love doesn't parade itself. Love is not rude. Love is what? Kind. Gentle. Seeking to restore. Seeking to what? Build up. And love has a cutting edge to it. Love doesn't just accept all things. Matter of fact, I've had to, in loving people, is saying, that's not good for you. Stop that. Right? That's, well, that's an edge to it. I've done it to my own kids. I've had to do it to me. So you instead look and say, stop that. No, that's, not, that's a cutting edge to it, but it's because you love them. Right? Speaking the truth in love. Why? Verse 15, to may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effect of working by which every part does its share. Wait a minute. Stop. If anybody is of the body of Christ, born again and in the body, what's it say? Do your share. I know one thing. My right hand does more than my left hand. Better equipped, stronger, more versatile, more agile. But boy, it doesn't want to do it at the expense of having this puppy. It still likes the left hand. It still does its share. Right? Every part doing its share. Every part doing its share. Knit together according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth. Wait a minute now. Causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself What's that? in love. Absolutely. We can't get away from that. I, I've told you before, I've had my experience with the Lord of the love of God. I remember talking to my son-in-law, which I mentioned to you early, several months ago when he was here. And I said, Adam, you can, you can read, you can study, you can quote verses, you can memorize, you can read all the books, you can quote all the authors. You can become Mr. Doctrine. You can just know you could teach the master's course. But if you have not love, you have not accomplished what God wants to do in your life. The love of the Lord is absolutely key. But you can have an experience with the Lord and he bathes you in his love. And if you do not learn the truth, you will be carried away with every wind and doctrine. You must 
you must, I must, we must always be learning of him. Learn of who he is. He's holy. He's truth. He's love. And he's given gifts to the church to help us to be equipped for those purposes and to edify ourselves and others. These fivefold gifts is what we'll be talking about next. Our next time we'll be talking about these fivefold functions, these fivefold gifts of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher operating in the church. It can get uh, kind of uh, sometimes hopefully bewildered or perplexed. I hope to keep it simple and straightforward so that we have understanding of how it operates in our lives. But let us not forget that it's always done. All of them have been given to us. The Holy Spirit operating in our midst. Why? Truth in love. Equipping. Edifying. All doing our part. Learning where we are. Not wishing we were this and wishing we were that, but in all these things, looking, saying, where, Lord, what do you have for me? Looking and operating in that realm to serve others, to equip others. Remember where the Holy Spirit is actually in our midst. He is in you. He has a part for you and I to play. And in this, he will equip us and edify us for that part. And he has given a five-fold gifting to the church to make sure that happens. Amen? Amen? That's what it's all about. So all we have to do is just say, yes, Lord. That's it. All right, yes, Lord. He will start moving upon you, giving that impulse, giving that touch, giving that word, giving this. And as we read and study, he'll start moving upon you in such a way you'll start being able to have that phone call, that word of encouragement, that gift, whatever it might be. And God will start bringing that out of you and to tell you where you're at. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. We just stand before the king. That Ephesians chapter 4 begins with the unity of the brethren. That's how it begins. The unity of the brethren. Remember, I, I think it's a Psalm 146. I can't remember. I think it's Psalm 146 where Aaron is anointed. And it says it goes down his beard and down the unity of the brethren. What a beautiful thing. Isn't that marvelous? That The unity of the body, the unity of the priesthood, the unity of the brethren. That's what it's all about. Bringing us all as a mature body, a complete man in Christ, gave gifts. Lord, thank you for the gifts that you have given unto the church. That we can help one another, encourage one another, edify, build up, equip. Knowing, Lord, that you are truly doing a good thing. That you, we don't have to be the person that we were. And we don't even have to be the person that we are right now. You are going to draw us to become more mature, more understanding, understand your truth in the love of God for the unity of the saints till we're all under the head, the perfect knowledge, the perfect man of Christ Jesus. We are being drawn together as the unity of the body, each one of us doing our part so that we, Lord Jesus, can receive all that you have for us Lord, we know that we have been given a great gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, help us to walk in that gift. Help us to recognize each and every day that you're with us and that we live for you. Father, though we have not yet addressed it, Lord, let apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers' hearts come forth. Lord, we call for it to surface, to blossom, to flourish. We call for it, Lord, to be made known, we call for it, Lord, to be all done truth in love. Speaking truth in love. Unity of the brethren. Each doing their part. Not priding themselves in, well, I'm an apostle. I'm a prophet. I'm a pastor. I'm a teacher. I'm a, oh, I'm an evangelist. Lord, instead, we don't pride ourselves in this. We operate with thanksgiving of heart. Saying, Lord, thank you for counting me worthy. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for touching my soul, my life. Help me, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help this church. Cause this church, Lord, to grow up, to mature, and to become truly a church that worships you in spirit and in truth. The unity of the brethren. The unity of the body of Christ, where Christ is head. In your name, Jesus, we pray. And the body of Christ said, Amen. Amen. May God's blessings truly be upon each and every one of you and your respective families. In Jesus' name, Amen. Praise the Lord.